over. I'd just like to welcome Marion McDonald now to the stage. Hello, Marion. <laughs> now, Marion, Marion, what can we say about Marion? <laughs> I'm sure there's a song in there. Um, Marion has been involved in the social enterprise world long before it even knew it was called social enterprise. Um, back when I was studying for my exams at school, you were conceiving with a group of people the idea for what's become a very successful, well-known and loved social enterprise called the Engine Shed. Um, Marion, you've got 25 years of experience just delivering one social enterprise and a wealth of social work and community volunteer work prior to that. It's, a, it's an awesome career in, in, in our sector and I would just like for everyone here to acknowledge the, the contribution that you've made to people's lives and to the, to the sector. Well done, Mary. Well, it's all in the heart, yeah, isn't it? Yeah. All in the heart. Um, so back in 1987, when you were uh, just like Simon and Frankie, uh, forming a steering group of people with ideas to, to make something happen. Um, there was nothing called social enterprise back then. How did you conceive, how did you perceive um, of the engine shed and its model or anything? Did, how did you reference it to yourself? Um, yeah, you're right. There wasn't anything called social enterprise. I think it was just seen as community development. Mm. And I'd worked in the community. And I went to work as a social worker at Garfield, Edinburgh. And there was a the recognised need that young people with learning disabilities, um, resources for them when they left school was very much day centred. So if you're young, you're a 16 year old person with a learning disability, you went to a special school and then you went to a day centre. Rummy and, and Edinburgh Council run day centre and that was kind of the limit to to their options um, a lot of young people themselves were saying that wasn't enough they wanted to go and get a job and that was just seen, it wasn't even on the agenda at that point no. but it became part of the council's agenda just after that but again it came from parents and young people who were quite focal and then again just getting people, again that kind of quite specific thing as well, getting, out, getting a few people from different parts of the of Edinburgh, partly social work and planning and then me as a fairly young kind of social work person and people that had worked at Garvold Edinburgh and just again having a few people that were willing to take it forward and just test out some ideas um, and it came up really very quickly because we kind of knew the basic thing was just giving young people a chance to access and experience that all young people access when they leave school which is that you want to take them forward. And for the young people we dealt with, they, they needed to access training in a public environment. That was one of the very first things that we said, that they had to get away from being in a special centre. Um, Shut off and they just had move. to be in an ordinary, everyday working environment. And as long as we kind of took on a kind of apprenticeship model for them, because a lot of our young people learn by doing. They don't learn by going to college. Well, they learn some things by going to college, partly being a student, which is good fun. And, and, um, but they don't have an academic kind of bent to them at all. They learn very much by being shown what to do and by doing it, looking at role models. So um, we, have made it, we have lots of clear things like that, that, that they needed to be in a public place so that the public were actually seeing young people with disabilities actually working and actually doing it really well. It's amazing to think um, that's so it's, that wasn't done. It was quite radical at the time. And so we had that and we had the fact that work had to be related to work. It sounded really basic things that it wasn't like going to teach them social skills or something. It was just teaching them about what is it like to be at work. And some of the basic mm. ones that Frank was saying, like getting up in the morning, coming in on time, using your initiative, taking responsibility, just basic things about coming into a job. Um, Garvel, the Edinburgh actually had work like vocational elements to their resources. So the idea of a bakery and a kind of cafe would. It was all kind of there. I think fact, my, my big thing was that it's like ideas, they're all there, and you just, it just takes people to pick them up and run with them. That's, we kind of kept it very, it was very, very practical, and it just felt like common sense most of the time. Every step felt like the next step. 
Um, so when you, when you started out, did you see the training centre and the cafe and the events venue? Well, where did you start and how did it grow? Well, it was, no, it's more interesting than that. In some ways, we actually thought quite small, in fact. We thought we could set up a small cafe in Edinburgh and in Newton. Actually, we had an idea for our premises, but the idea seemed to just inspire people and it, got, it just got bigger and bigger. And um, we went out way back in 87, 88, and the south side is a lot of, that was kind of quite flat. There was a, a lot of buildings that had been knocked down years before, and they were kind of rebuilding this, that part of Edinburgh. And the engine shed was a building that just hadn't been knocked down, basically, and it was all boarded up. And mm. then there was a kind of a, a kind of scrap yard, I think, in front of it. There wasn't any houses in front of it. But a lot of people that were working in the area got together and, again, right, actually around one table at one meeting, and the engine shed building was probably going to go to Edin Far for their, their headquarters, their office headquarters. And again, sharing ideas, they actually stepped back and said, new ideas, but then our idea, you should have it. That's which nice. was amazing, <laughs> amazing kind of gift, really. Wow. But then we had faced with this building thinking, that's too big, it's huge. No, we only want a wee cafe for eight training places for people with learning disabilities. Um, but that's when we spent a year or two building up the fact that we could have, we could have a bakery and we could have... We decided to, to work in the catering industry, not because we're just training people to become caterers, but it's a good one for making money and it's also a very practical setting for people to learn about being in a work setting because a lot of the jobs are kind of limited. They have to do a job and then that's done and then they do another job. It's very structured um, and it creates a, a, quite a good learning environment and it's also very public. Um, and also the other link was that Garwood Edinburgh had a big link with food, um, organic food, so there's a food kind of element came into it as well. Um, so it just developed from there. Again, with everybody chip chipping in the ideas. Um, and it really helped, in fact, because we just kind of l launched at a time when European Social Fund money was coming into Edinburgh Council. Well uh, done. Or into Edinburgh, not into, into Edinburgh itself. Um, or maybe it was into Scotland, actually, I suppose. And, um, and that was for vocational training. And everything just seemed to, there seemed to be a point in the, in the ideas when something it just clicks and it felt like it all fit in very well together. So was the ESF, the European Structural Funds, part of a major turning point for the engine shed and for yourself? I think, yeah, I think it wouldn't have, um, it probably wouldn't have happened without, well, without the funding. Because the whole idea with what, what we actually had from, from the plan was that, that um, or what actually happened was we'd get money through the European fund, well, if you obviously have to apply for it and try and get it, and then we would get match funding from the council, and that we would make money. We obviously knew we'd make money. Um, we never ever worked out how much money we'd make, or I remember the first time after the first year thinking, gosh, we made all that money. We made a lot of money in the first year without, without trying at all. It was just like we were selling things and obviously you make money. And it was kind of, we came from the care background as well. So we went, people that were sitting up to do a business, we just thought that was really quite neat to get some money from the council, money from Europe, and, and we'll make, make some, some too. We'll Magic. do that too. And that was quite nice. And <laughs> first and social it, enterprise is born. <laughs> yeah. And in some ways, we, yeah, we were from the... We were from this kind of very traditional background, but in fact, everything seemed to break all the rules, because I know when we first started, people kept saying we got some seed money from the health board, because that the, the whole thing about profession, uh, like the Gogeburn profession was kind of happening. So people were beginning to think about people coming out of long stay hospitals, and people sh should have a place in the community. Got a little bit of money from there, but we were told kind of quite, um, quite clearly that I thought it was a great idea, but it was never gonna work. Basically, that's what we got the money, and just, well, we were told it was never going to work. Or people were wishing as well, but just didn't think it was going to work. And what they didn't think was going to work was that people with learning disabilities would could work in kitchens and in public places. Or they why not? Well, they th they would think it was too dangerous because the the whole idea for people with learning disabilities is that they got looked after so well that they they didn't think they could do anything. They're really. institutionalised. Yeah, and even quite fairly what we would say very mild to people with a very mild and moderate learning disability were, were kind of looked after to very protected um, and we've, we ha we've had that one of the first experiences once we've been up for about six months was having a group of counsellors coming around to have a look around the engine shed because people always want to come and have a look and 
if I kind of wonder them was horrified that we allowed them to use knives in the kitchen. And we were thinking, how can you cut vegetables without knives? <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose the answer was they would worry about them cutting themselves. And we would go, yeah, they will, they will cut themselves. You know, yeah, like we would cut ourselves, but they'll learn how not to cut themselves. And sure. everything is like, <laughs> it's, um, and, and, and it, like, an awful lot that happened all the time, you know, that parents, at the beginning, it's very much a work model. So parents weren't encouraged to come in and become too involved. We were trying to take young people into a growing up stage. So before, before the NGZ, they would have had meetings with parents and social workers and psychologists, and they'd have lots of meetings in their lives about their plans. <coughs> And the engine said they had to come for an interview and they had to they had to kind of prove to us that they were interested enough to, to come or motivated enough to come to the engine shed and then they would have more like an appraisal systems. And it was like a review, but they didn't have parents and and people lined at these meetings. We just recorded the meetings. Um, not, well, not all the time. So we got away from the we just got into the fact they were adults and they didn't have to have people sitting in the room if they were talking about their work. Themselves. And that made a huge difference to them. They started treating them like young adults. And obviously there's safeguards and all these things too, but um, it made a huge difference. And, and particularly the interview stage, because a lot of people could never imagine young people coming with a learning disability, coming for an interview and talking about themselves. Mm. And you just push the adults away and they, they will talk about themselves. And that worked really well for them. So there's quite a, there's quite a legacy you've created, you know, uh, successful business, uh, training opportunities, <laughs> being quite radical in, in even changing the way people with, the, uh, with learning disabilities are perceived, how the system interacts with them. That's a huge amount of influence that you've been quietly handling over the years. You know, if you look back, give, me, give us something that makes you really proud. Have you got any stories that make you really proud of what you've done over these years? I think the main thing, and people kind of always talk about what gets you to bed, bed in the morning, I think the main thing is just watching the, the change and the development in the young people. And, and perhaps the bit that makes me proud and quite humble is the fact that you don't have to do a lot to, to help people. Like you just give them, you kind of work out what somebody needs and you, you offer it. And, and they come in, they've got to meet you more than halfway actually. And I think that's what we find with our youngsters, that they meet us more than halfway. They're kind of, they're eager to, to, to take on the opportunities and go with them. And the biggest thing that we sort of say to people, you're not coming to the engine shed for us to get you a job, you're coming to the engine shed for us all to work towards. Everybody's working towards um, whether a job's the outcome or not. So it wasn't just us kind of doing good. But I think that's a, a it kind of makes me really proud to watch them hmm. change and, and really struggle and really come out of the comfort zone because a lot of them could, a lot of our group could actually stay on benefits. You know, they're on a benefit that they can stay on it because they've seen the need of help and support and they've got to take that big step, uh, that big transition into, well, I'm leaving this comfort bit behind. And why would they want to do that? I think it's actually a natural thing and for young, all of us and young people, you want to fulfil some, something like your potential in some kind and you want to show people you can do things and you want to get on in the world and I think that's what they, they want to do as well, they want to, to have achievements and to take and to be given a chance to take one step at a time. We talked about this one step at a time because I think before they would always people would say you can't do that, it's too difficult. But nobody thought, well, how about just breaking it into small steps mm -hmm. and take one step and once you get one success it kind of helps somebody get move on to the next success. And we've had amazing stories of um, well even we would do it to like we just as guilty, you know, we had a young a young man who um, was very nervy and 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 quite slow in working, and we put him in what we thought was the best work, work area in the NGJ because it's a bit supported and away from the public. Um, and he kept saying, I want to work in a cafe. And we were thinking, oh, you'll never manage that. It's far too, far too, we're just as bad. It's far too difficult. Um, and he kind of made a big, obviously at this meeting, he was saying that he did. So we did that. We, we actually put him into our cafe, and there was lots of tears, and he could see he was living on his nerves a lot because it was quite difficult for him. But he worked his way through that got a work placement in a cafe, in the Film House Cafe, which is a very mm -hmm. busy cafe, okay. and organised his own job by just kind of saying to him, what a job, you know, and he got a job. And at the very end, um, we had some students coming in to, to, to do a project and to talk to our trainees about what they think and what they thought. And so somebody had spent a bit of time with him and it was recorded for us later. And what he was, he was giving them the story of how 
and there's a little boy he used to go around around cafes when he was young with his mum. I used to sit and think, when I grew up, I want to work in a cafe. That was his big dream, <coughs> and it was kind of quite private. and And it was obviously something that really kind of pushed him, powered him into putting himself on the line quite a lot. So kind of get these stories later, and he never told us that. We never knew that at all till till the very end. But it's like everybody's got their dreams, and and they're quite quiet. People kind of hold on to their dreams and. It's just giving somebody the space to, to feel that <coughs> they are going to be listened to and that maybe things are tailor-made sometimes for people too. You know, in a way that you've got to give somebody, we have the general support at the engine shed and it just looks like we're working all the trainees into the ground, running our cafes <laughs> and our bakery. But and your tofu. And it's true, and it's bread. true up to a point. But um, underneath all that, there is this individual, um, the space for listening to somebody, what they're, what they're thinking, what they're learning, what they don't like. Um, and just giving them that chance. We used to always say to people, what's, what's your dream? What's, what's it you really fancy doing if you could? And obviously there's some wild and fancy things and you kind of take a wee bit of it for them, a wee bit of that and think, well, you could try this bit, try and do this. This might might be something. So I think that's what we do. We try and do this individual. What, what's, what's it you're trying to do and how can we help you? So there's, there's a lot of social firms. Um, so a social firm, just to be clear, is an organisation that employs more than 50% of its uh, employees who have some kind of learning or physical disability. Is that correct? That's right. <coughs> we're not really a social firm. You're not a social firm. We're a bit, again, like, like, mm. like frankly, in the sense that the people move on, but we're not employing them as such, we're training no, them. You're in training. And so they all move on. They come. They, one of the other bits about our, our training was it had to have a beginning, a middle and an end. It had to be really clear, because the thing with people with learning disabilities was the other model was they went into a centre and they could stay for Ever. 20 years, 40 years, whatever it was. So ours is a three year um, training project and they have a beginning and a middle and end to it. So they all move on and as, as they're getting better and better, um, we get, they get out, they're moving, they're moving on from the day that they come in because we have work experience placements. So it's never a standstill experience for them that they, they come in for the first six months to we get their coming in in time and the their attitude right and then after that they're moving on to a wide range of employers in Edinburgh right from the beginning so mm -hmm. they're beginning to make their own connections as well which is good. So you've got uh, your your work in your social enterprise is to help young people uh, to achieve their dreams and to learn skills and um, go out and be able to find employment. I know that the engine sheds um, in a, a massive turning point stage and I don't want to put you on the spot, but I do want to ask you: um, the engine sheds facing closure at the moment. Uh, the sector is very aware of that. If you were to look back over the years, what are the what are the things that, if any of us social entrepreneurs in the room, might need to be aware of, um, in terms of how can we make sure that this creature that we're creating, this organisation that we're creating, doesn't suddenly get pulled away from us. You know, you've mm. got your circumstance where your where your funding comes from. H how can we be better prepared for ensuring that the the rug doesn't come out from underneath us? What should we do? It's kind of a good question in the sense that obviously over the, the last twenty five years, it's not just been really easy, and all the funding's come anyway. So we've faced lots of challenges from changes in European money about six, seven, eight years ago, and we responded to that by becoming much more of a business and a social enterprise so we started much more into not just making money but trying to make break even or make a profit so we had a huge um, review at that point and we actually succeeded in, in um, filling the gap with about a 30% cut in our funding about six seven years ago and um, so we, we had the kind of abilities to do that but I don't know I just think you have to respond be ready to respond to what's happening and sometimes things happen that are just too big. Mm -hmm. And actually accepting that, not that I think it's, it's, it's this isn't positive, but to actually think, like, you can't just keep going, like any business can't keep going if you're not going to be funded to do what you're meant to be doing. So for, for us, for the council this time, we've had lots of threats of cuts over the years, and that's just part and parcel of council funding. Um, but this time, 40, all of our money, all the funding going for our training, it's, at a, at it's just that one stroke taking away 40% of our, our total income. 
So we make over 50% and we make a little bit more by some fundraising. But like, some of sometimes like hands up, that's too much. You know, you can't do it. Um, it's quite good to look at what's possible and what's not possible. But using the model we've got, we can't do it because our model is so much, it is very much about having 30 young people and giving them a really good training experience. And it's a model in its own right. Um, we're actually doing a lot, we're doing a piece of research at the moment mm -hmm. to go back 25 years and look at people as they've kind of had the training and how it's affected their lives. So to us, it's a, mo it's a transition model. It's a model to help people make a transition. And there's nowhere else, um, no other model in Edinburgh that quite does that for young people with learning disabilities. So I'm not sure what advice I give people. I think that they keep always being vigilant about the environment that, that, that you're working in. But sometimes it can be just too much. And sometimes you think, well, I can't. I don't have a solution to that apart Which from... Function? Apart from actually thinking that if we close down, we need to begin to think about a business, a much more business first model uh, approach. If we're going to set up something new, we would be setting up it as a business rather than as a care care organisation going into a more and more business like we. Um, we'll be setting up a business model and seeing if we can actually do some social so have a social impact in form of training. So, um, one, of the, one more question is really about the assets that you're in. So the engine shed is a beautiful building, it's a fantastic venue many people use and uh, it's owned by the council. Yeah. You have a peppercorn rent just like... No, no, no you no, don't no, have a peppercorn no, rent. No. Not all peppercorn rent. No. But you have managed to draw down a huge amount of uh, funding over the years to improve the building. How does that work with funders paying to develop an asset that you as a social enterprise don't own? And what's going to happen to it now that if you do close, does the council get it back? Yeah, again, it's, uh, it's interesting because in some ways I, I'm still not quite sure. But yeah, we have over the years t turned the building into what's obviously kind of completely kind of Great, it's like obviously all the everything's been renewed over the years, and we've got amazing new kitchen just kind of renovated a couple of years ago. Mm. And um, we're actually, actually, I'm still having to work out what will happen to what will actually the whole process of closing down is going to happen. It'll happen February, March next year, so I'm still really work, working on that. But it feels like you, it's like you're saying if you've got your own, if you've got your own premises, you're actually investing in your own premises, whereas this money's coming in to. Another person's, another person's building. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't really have an answer to that. I just don't know what will happen. I think we'll obviously um, fixtures and fittings. Um, well, equipment will probably be allowed to kind of. So that's ours. So we're allowed to, s to sell that mm. and probably use that for for the new business. Mm -hmm. Probably, yeah. So we've had a lot of equipment. We also had some equipment from to the lottery lottery funds so that in fact goes free of charge to to other organizations which is only right it feels fine actually so the road's been tough you've had tremendous successes you're in a little bit of a there's going to be a change there could be a rebirth sometime next year in the in a different type of model if you're you're, you're the um I'll say the oldest and wisest social entrepreneur in the room here. Um, what advice would you give to others treading the path behind you? Don't, don't do it. No, 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 don't do it. No, I don't. No, I don't. I was talking before the show. I just think it's it's a really like I've had a really interesting job over the last twenty five years, and seeing that just before the show that um, I used to think um, I never thought I'd ever be in this one role over the 25 years and the jobs change all, changes all the time so it's helped me develop a lot um, and I used to think right I must stop I must go and do something else now I must kind of see what else is out there there must be something I can do but then I thought I'll just stay in the here and see what happens next <laughs> I don't know about, about seeing what's going to happen next um, and I think there's lots of I know when I first started a way back like it's not it's not just enthusiasm you've got to rethink it through but if you go out there Ideas are really powerful. I remember actually, we were talking about that the other day at work, that we just had, at the beginning, we just had ideas that a few people shared. And people, when we talked to them, thought it was real. And we used to think, it's, n it's not real. We're, we're just in our heads, it's a bit like what you did. Um, but people kept saying, so when is it going to happen then? And the other bit is that people start doing amazing things for you, that things do happen for you. Um, if you get out there yourself and 
it does seem to attract a lot of positive stuff. And we've had so many people um, helping. I'm, I'm really great at asking people <coughs> for the ideas and help. And people will are really happy to help you kind of solve solve things. Um, our employers, uh, the employers that take our youngsters, I've just been probably the one of the most supportive group of people in Edinburgh for us actually. They, when we did our last, um, when we were faced with 30% cuts way back eight or nine years ago, it was actually an employer, one of our catering employers, their consultants that came in and helped us to, to revamp the whole, the whole model. So it was like getting, really getting, inf getting really expertise from people that you think, that like, well, we back years ago wouldn't have wanted to have anything to do with people with lenses as boaters or something, but they were kind of coming in and um, wanting to be part of helping us for the future. So I think it'd be dead open and and to share ask people and uh, that my network again is like I'm really into the social like enterprise networks, but I'm into all these other networks too. But there's just a lot of people out there that are, that are quite happy to help. I was good to somebody with as much expertise as possible and. Just asking somebody how they do it, or and they'll tell you most of the time. And you often give your time and expertise, just like now, uh, to help others to do it too. Um, thank you, Marion. I'd just like to thank all of our speakers tonight for sharing their their stories. Uh, we hope that this is an opportunity this evening to learn from people who've been treading the path before us, uh, to find out what makes them tick, to find out how their enterprise, their models work and what they're doing to make the world a better place. And I hope that all of you in the room tonight through Entrepreneurship Week are motivated and excited and get out there and go and make the world a better place. Thank you very much, everybody.